Commander Cockins and Captain Bird here, yet again, this week, as with every week, for another Trek Girls Mission Briefing. And if you guys don't know what the show is by now, you've got so many of them to go watch. So go watch that, and I have the same intro for all of them. So I'm going to diversify and not even say the intro. Yeah, but this yeah. is this is still the yeah this is still the relaxed discussion show about a ship of the Trek universe so we can discuss it later on, asking facts and figures from you guys but discuss it before we know all the information in advance. And what are we doing today, Stuart? Well, firstly, I'd like to point out that yes, we don't look at facts and figures before we do this show. A lot of people have said, "Didn't we look at things?" Well, no. We know what we know, and that's what we apply to this show. And then we do the exhaustive research for the main Saturdays. Yeah. Exactly. And some ships so, we know more about, some ships we don't. And that's the fun thing to ask those questions. It's like, what on earth is that? This one a bit yeah. different because we know some more information, but still. Anyway. And this week we tackle the most deadly, powerful, and kick-ass little ship that Starfleet has to offer. The USS Defiant. Uh, or the Defiant class. <laughs> you got a huge one. Wow. Okay. I do, yeah. <laughs> At 170 meters, this was a small ship, about half the size of a steamroller, or Norway class, both at 355. Uh, it is 427 meters smaller than the Galaxy class, and 119 meters smaller than the Constitution class. Pretty small. Um, and it's about the same size as the Enterprise Zero Intrepid class at 165 meters. Hmm. So once more onto the breach, dear friends. Let's move to the first picture. <laughs> All right. So this is a great shot uh, with the moon in the background. Yeah. Um, Doing its test fly around of the solar system. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Um, Nice compact little ship. It's kind of a new design for Starfleet, so it's this... revolutionary almost. Um, oh. And it kind of breaks the line of sight rule for the oh, it obliterates missiles. it. Yeah, yeah, and it obliterates them being inside the, the hull and all these things. Yeah. yeah. So some people aren't happy about it. <laughs> some people we know, yeah. But this first shot is a game engine render. Not sure what game. I think it's a fan game. Um, but yeah, it, it, like I said, it's very different, but it's still got the familiar red and blue glows, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, all the pens, all the things. And there's a lot of surface detail. That's that's a really nice thing. A small scale ship like this, they put a lot of thought, Jim Martin who designed it, put a lot of thought into different contours and different lines and different details. Because obviously, you know, you can you can make a more detailed 3D model because it's so small. And so mm -hmm. it'd be interesting to know what a lot of these things are. I think we know what some of them are, but uh, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, uh, when I first saw it, I was kind of mm, like, yeah. well, that's an interesting take on a Starfleet look. I mean, I wasn't super happy with it for a long time, but it does kind of grow on you. Yeah. You either like it or you don't like it at first sight. Yes, I, I don't... I mean, DS9, that would have been... I would have been so young, I wouldn't have remembered seeing it. But the, I remember the first time I remember, remember seeing it, I was like, well, that's kick-ass. Um, because I think I saw it in context, like I saw a few episodes in a row. I was like, wow, that ship really blows up other ships. I mean, from mm -hmm. other ships of the time, you know, the TNG ship, uh, the Galaxy class, obviously didn't really do very much blowy, uppy, kicky, arsey. <laughs> and suddenly this episode comes in, and two episodes in, it's like pulse phases and quantum. It's like, wow, okay. Um, and I always thought it was a very elegant design. I don't think when I saw it for the first time, I was thinking, wow, it breaks all the Starfleet rules. Because at the, at the end of the day, those Starfleet rules there's more like there's more than you think it's it, the, the rule isn't sorcerer and secondary hell that's just a design style there's, there's so many variations within that and so i just thought okay this makes sense everything's there in its own way and it's still got a sort of starfleet look even if it's different um i i still felt it fitted in because it was a different style of ship i mean come on they were at deep deep space nine which is a totally different aesthetic anyway so it was like here's a brand new ship for a totally different aesthetic show so it's like okay cool not like that show ever really stuck. I mean, come on, the, the Yiga class and all these random kit builds in the show, nothing's Federation to style in that show. So it makes sense. This should be mm -hmm. odd and interesting. Okay, and it must be interesting from that point of view too to be so young and see it. Because, yeah, to see this thing doing the maneuvers it does and just do -do -do pulse, you know, yeah. firing and then just knocking ships out of the picture yeah. is a new thing for Star Trek. You don't really yeah. see that. You see, like, galaxies and stuff coming in from battle and just firing phasers, but not the maneuvering. Well, there's no dynamic. So, yeah, it's an movement, interesting so. take. Um, I, I think I had the same yeah. reaction when I saw Prometheus. Prometheus is a more elegant, starfleet -y design. But just thinking, and especially since the episode that comes in, it can cloak, you've got the Romulans in, you've got all these, or the Romulan, you've got all these extra elements. Just, wow, that's a good episode. It really, it really, that was the turning point for me for, for, D, uh, for Deep Space Nine. Wow, they finally got a ship. Finally got a Federation ship. This is what I wanted to see from DS9. And so when I was watching, I was like, wow, this is this. Mm -hmm. and, you know, like I wouldn't have wanted them just to get a basic Connie or a whatever. It just wouldn't have really fitted the style. So I think, you know, it works. But yeah, onto the next picture. As we always love them, this is a nice cross-section. And since it's such a small damn ship, 
You had to fit a lot in. Mm -hmm. So what do you see? What does your what do you go straight for then? Well, the first thing I really notice is um, the front where it says airlock. Now it's always amazed me when this thing docks at Deep Space Nine. Yeah. It docks attached using this part, which I always thought was the deflector. But apparently there's an airlock in there that they can oh. walk in and out of. I don't well, know if that's the middle part. Have a look part. at a big model. Is that what, what's in the middle of the of the deflector area? As my scale, I've got a little space that could be a thing. Yeah, well, this one it's not really colored so well. Oh yeah. But there's like a triangle shape, and then underneath it's a round. There you go. Airlock shape. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's still space. Just have a, a physical. I mean, it's like the equivalent of having a Jeffrey's tube, TOS style, because they were so huge, <laughs> in between yeah. the deck. I mean. But that is certainly interesting because you've got to then walk a long way through the ship and and you know, yeah. Well, it's not a big ship; it doesn't take long to walk. No, no, but it, yeah, you've got to walk, you know, the length of the ship almost just to get out. But yeah, without knowing that airlock's there, it just seems odd the way it docked. I always thought it just yeah. why is it docked that way? How do they get out? Because I, th I thought the whole thing was a deflector at the front. Well, like it'd be more natural to you know dock there and have the airlock just behind the bridge. Mm hmm. You know, have a little thing have to do with gravity, but that's not really an issue. But yeah, I mean. This, yeah, this always feels like a separate piece to me. It feels like this is this is a dedicated high energy deflector because you've got to consider this ship can still go to what nine point nine whatever. It's still a very very fast ship, and so all the parts that are in a Prometheus or in a Galaxy or in a Sovereign to compress them, well, it makes sense. You need a big deflector still, and that the whole unit would have to be it. But this picture doesn't really speak to that, does it? I know. And the interesting thing I'm looking at this too. I've always wondered about this ship, this front part, because on this model. It actually articulates. Yes, mine does too, which is weird. It does on the on the little uh, eagle moss as well. So yeah. what is it? Is it meant to detach and be its own ship? I don't because know. if you look if you look at the bottom there, yeah, um, it says uh, tor and probe launcher, and then un underneath oh, that it yeah. says warhead impulse engines. It and it looks like it does look like there's a separation line, roughly. So with is an this instant. is this a warhead? Is this like a cruise missile or something? That can launch you can overload the sensor mate I mean, there's a torpedo tube though which i never know there's a torpedo launcher i thought it was either side of the, that's probably uh, what that circle is on my big one it's not big enough for an airlock i don't think and there's also a warhead control room in that section as well that's interesting i mean if you if there's a torpedo launcher there then you've got to store torpedoes so you could just fire it in and then set all the torpedoes to overload and you've got a pretty nice warhead there i suppose mm -hmm. interesting i can't imagine they do it though in the show because then, what are you gonna do? You gotta to, go, to go back to DS9, missing this bit, flying. But right, we've got a new one flying in, flying in from Utopia Planitia. What the hell happened? Like I don't know. How are we gonna dock now? <laughs> but yeah, what I see when I look at this ship, I, I see all the escape pods hidden around in odd locations. There's escape pods in the middle of the back section, and I don't know how they. That would be these ones. Um, just they're in set. Right? Okay, so they go up. So jettison yeah. out and up, okay. Yeah. Because it's difficult to tell with these with these sort of views because they're they're two D, so it's there's a lot of detail we can't see. Um, One of the other things I noticed that I never knew before, uh, I actually see landing gear. Yes, I saw on a like, later picture, but yeah, that would so, that would have been really fun to see because this ship out of every ship in Starfleet would make the most sense to land because it is so small, still million of millions of tons, but I mean, you know. And I think. I think that would be these ridged areas. There, there, and there, and there. Maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that works for me. Interesting. It's harder to see on the Eagle Moss, but yeah, yeah. you can still see them. So I don't know. If, like, I would love to see this thing land. That would have been cool. Well, maybe with the full episode, we can do animation for it. And by we, I mean me. Uh, one thing that I find that's always interesting, obviously the set is built a certain way, and it's not necessarily meant to connect logically. So it's interesting to see where all the pieces we know are. The bridge is obviously on the top. You've got a single transporter pad. It's not even a room, really. It's just a pad. It's right at the top. The warp core is one one deck down. I do love, though, the, the uh, shuttle bay at the bottom. Cause I, I, I don't know if they ever, when they designed it initially, to think, let's put a shuttle bay in, because, again, it's not... This this ship doesn't scream, let's have shuttles. Because it's almost like, it's just a very, very big shuttle in a, in a, in a you know, in a sense um yeah but so to, to make the circle just just a bay that just drops down i think that's great and again pushes away from the starfleet aesthetic but makes so much sense um tactically as well yeah absolutely because i mean it, when it, it given the profile of the ship it would be in the shield grid so even in battle it can come down and be completely protected 
one thing that I'm noticing though yeah. um, is the placement of the computer core underneath the transporter rim there. Generally, the uh, computer core is on Federation ships is right below the bridge mm. on each side. Mm. There's two, two computer cores, and this one's oh. not underneath the bridge, which is kind of interesting. Well, it's roughly in the middle of the ship, isn't it? Well, mm, it, ish. Yeah, it's sort of in the most <laughs> thickest part of the ship. Yeah. But yeah. Um, but I'd be interested to walk through the ship and. I mean, it feels very submarine. That's a different, probably a different picture of the interiors, but it's, it's a very sort of submarine feeling ship. I'd be, interested, to be, there, yeah. I'd be interested to know how long it would take to walk from one side to the other, especially given that obviously a lot of these rooms are not going to be connected because um, obviously decks, there's no stairs, so there's a turbo lift. So, I mean, is it just like simple deck plan, up one level, smaller deck plan? I mean, I'd be interested to see the full deck plan for this because it is such a small vessel. It really is. I do have full deck plans somewhere, but I didn't include them in the mission briefing here so anyway moving on to the next picture we've got an interesting orthos with some information here but it certainly is one hell of a patch isn't it <laughs> yeah it's a cool patch i love that absolutely love that it's reminiscent of the world war ii uh fighter planes mm. with the like the the uh p40s yeah with the teeth and the yeah i'm sure that's what we're going for but yeah it's very clever assimilate this is the tagline <laughs> yeah which is the ironic thing, which I think we'll see later on. But yeah, it doesn't. It's designed to fight the Borg. Pretty much failed to fight the Borg. So I would have thought. I mean, a cube is one of those things where it takes so much punishment, takes such a long time to defeat it. I wouldn't have thought you'd make small ships that can be, you know, taken out after a few. Well, not a few, but that can't survive as many, uh, you know, disruptor beams or you know, just cutting beams. I would have thought build a bigger ship with more shielding, more hull armor. And while it's got a blade of armor, I don't think it would be enough. Um, because then you would you want you know oh damn we've lost six defiance already oh no we should have built them stronger like just because you got the attack I mean they said in the episode things like you know eighty seven percent of the board cube can be destroyed before it stops being functional mm -hmm. so you need you need you need a ship to last longer rather than keep punching holes because well you have to get to eighty six percent to be able to actually do some real damage well the thing is it's a tough little ship and it, you, it makes you wonder if the, the size is actually beneficial at fighting the board because the board don't really if they don't consider you a threat they don't pay attention sure. to you so a smaller ship kind of getting in closer and then having the punch of quantums as well as pulse perhaps yes. wouldn't be considered as much a threat until the last second but when have we ever been first struck against the borg well i think we're, saying, we're always reactionary with... and by the point when you went by the point that you're reactionary they're already on the warpath as it were they're already attacking anything yeah they but see. if you got if you got a galaxy and akira and a defiant coming at you logically, you're going to take out the bigger ones first. Well, I mean, that's what we see in the movie. All the other ships have been destroyed, pretty much. Yeah. But the Defiance just about still flying around. So I'm sure that is the case, but didn't do him much good, even with a fleet of advanced ships. No, um, I This agree. is an interesting one, because it says length is 119, and, mm. you know, the Defiant is a known length, odd-sized ship. It does vary, uh, and that's we'll get into that a little bit later on, with the size multiple mm -hmm. sources multiple things and while the scale you can you should be able to work out you see it differently on screen so there is no yeah. it canonically changes because it just didn't keep track of it for the, the cg shots which is a problem it's a huge problem and uh one of the star trek's major flaws as far as i'm concerned especially with the hero ship of ds9 yeah absolutely yeah. well only crew complement 50 yeah i don't know how i don't know how you felt but i always felt there's more crew than that in the episodes not a lot more um, but when they're I in the didn't. mess hall, it's like the mess hall is like 16 people. You're telling me that's a, th a, th a third of the crew is all having drinks at the same time. Well, they'd be on different uh, shifts. So, yeah, when one's, one shift gets off, they'd all go to the mess hall and eat and go go to sleep. you got three different, three or four different shifts. I suppose then if there's only... Because there's no science labs. You've really only got engineering and the bridge. So you say you need, what, like seven people for the bridge, seven people for engineering, one doctor... And then, like, you're right, other shifts. So you really only need... You probably could minimise that. You probably need, like, ten people to operate it. And we see uh, in the Marquis episode when uh, the other Riker takes over the ship, we only get the sense they have four people and they still manage to fly it no problem. So it's Skeleton, probably... skeleton crew, yeah. It's probably automated a lot, so you could do that, yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure you can reroute easily. I mean, that, that front console that Jazir, Jadzir uses is a hell of a console. I mean, that has a lot of functionality, I'm sure, because mm -hmm. L-cars are interchangeable. You could say, right, this size weapons, this size maneuverability, so do -do -do -do, fire. You could probably do it all from one console, because it's that small of a ship. Yeah, I don't doubt that at all. 
um, an army. So yeah, I, d I don't think there's a very very big crew because there's not a lot of crew quarters and space for that. But like you say, so, shifts. I mean, you could have you know if twenty of them are always on, then you only need space for another few people. Um, I don't know. I always got the feeling it was a bit more. But I guess you never really get a sense of that in the show. And again, when scale changes, the size feels different in the show. It's like, ah, oh, well, how many people? It depends um, on the mission, too. The mission profile. You'd have oh, yeah. less yeah. people for certain missions. I mean, or... if you need just an assault team to, to, to land and, and, and you know attack something, we need to have a team of 10 people just for that. So obviously yeah. it'll be different. Um, warp 9.5, so not the fastest ship. Uh, but that's the same as the E, I believe. I think we said that was the same as the E. Uh, yes, I believe so. Yeah, and then Voyager's 9.975 and Prometheus 9.99. So it's actually quite a lot. It's not as fast as you think. <laughs> um, and it's armed with four phaser cannons. At least, at least three phaser emitters. <laughs> at least four four tubes. <laughs> at yeah. least, very nice. Uh, and it's worth noting too that the Defiant is the only one with a cloaking device, apart from the Phoenix. But that, was that the Phoenix? Well, but that was a bit failed. The transphasic cloak. But yeah, I'm just saying, for authorized. this class of warship, they aren't all made with cloaking devices. Yeah, that the really... Defiant had special permission from the Romulan government to have the go against the treaty and have a cloaking device. Which is interesting then, because we always associate this class, this ship is the Defiant and you know the cloaking ability, but really that's every other ship is just that fast tactical warship. There's no stealth involved with the actual Defiant we know has that ability to do both. Mm. Hmm. Completely different strategies then between the two, two versions of the ship. Interesting. Anyway, so the next picture is a fantastic picture from the technical manual done by Rick, Doug, and all those amazing people. And this is the deck plan, as it were. Um, yeah, that looks really compact. It looks like there's really only a corridor going around and then internal rooms. Mm -hmm. Wow. And you can see the transporter room in there behind the bridge. The engineering room. Yeah. Wow. Is that it, 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 So really, it's just the first deck is just those three rooms the second deck is then uh the I, well, I probably just with them just be the shuttle bay and crew quarters yeah i would imagine mm. and look at those engines i mean those are some serious warp coils and some serious impulse engines at the back there um well some of that's deuterium storage i'm sure yeah, yeah but it's like it is that's it feels like it's the minimum you know size it needs to be sort of thing mm -hmm. it's interesting i like it Cool. I love how there's like four warp coils when the galaxy has like six or seven in those longer engines. Yeah. So I wonder if they're just different warp coil design. Oh, I think they'd be. I think they would redesign them. Yeah, to fit in such a small body. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. So that is it for this week's Trek Yards, guys. Hope you loved it. Tune in again for the continuation. Keep your eyes peeled because it's coming. Ooh, looking forward to it. Me too. Me three. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>